Hello, everyone, and welcome to Contact Lost, the Polish English speaking podcast about competitive Warhammer 40k, both in Poland and abroad. Um, I'm your host, Tomek, aka Tweak, and today I am recording this from a hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. So if I break up at any time or if there are any like problems with the connection, blame the hotel, not me. Um, due to the time difference that we have, uh, Joker, my usual co host, couldn't join, he's probably asleep, but he is working on another episode when he's not asleep, so you'll probably hear him soon, I hope. Um, and today we are starting um, a series of WTC summary episodes. Um, we will be interviewing, in those episodes, we will be interviewing players who attended the event, uh, we will try to get their account of, of the event and, and, you know, this whole crazy Warhammer 40k bonanza that WPC is. Mm. And I'm sorry for, like, silence in, 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 in the recent weeks. First of all, Joker, myself, Vitalis, we were on holidays. Second of all, we couldn't really tell you much about the lists, the players and the events because the top teams... Uh, that attended the event were pretty secretive about uh, what they were bringing and how they were going to use it. I think we're going to hear quite a lot about uh, that from my my guests today. Um, however, now you know, we can say whatever we want, so um, stay with us because it, it's going to be a really interesting episode. And to those of you who don't know what WTC is, and I know that there are still people who don't know, uh, I've seen that on Reddit, I answered some question about this, I've seen that on Facebook, I couldn't believe, but still, yes, there are people who don't know. Uh, the abbreviation stands for World Team Championships, where I think, correct, correct me guys if I'm wrong, 28 teams representing 27 countries uh, duke it out for like tracking rights and everlasting glory, I guess. Um, I said 27 uh, countries, but 28 teams, so something's not right. That's because there was one more team called Warhammer Undivided, and that was the team of mercenaries. Tune in for the next episode because we will have an episode with uh, a guy from Poland who was on that team. So uh, it's going to be another interesting episode, I guess. Um, so yeah, so that's the introduction now. I think there is no better way to start a series like this than to invite the current reigning champions of the world Team Australia, and to meet with me today, I have uh, representatives of the current reigning champions of the world, Australia, the coach, Denis. Enchanté, cunts. <laughs> and the absolute backbone of the team, and the guy who absolutely ruled in the Warmaster singles event as well, Liam Hackett. G'day, everybody, g'day. Hi guys. So yeah, the introductions are done. Uh, how are you feeling, guys? I mean, have you already managed to deal with the jet lag and you know the, the trip home and so on? And, and how are you dealing with? Are you drunk with success? Uh, Liam, I think I've just been drinking for like two days, so I'm just <laughs> staying awake as much as I can, and I'll eventually sleep at a normal time. How about you? You're back to work, right? Yep. So uh, we we landed at about uh, eight p.m. Uh, two days ago, and I went to work at 7 a.m. the next day. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I'm... Talk about dedication. It. I'm suffering. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Is the hangover over? Or... <laughs> no, 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 no. I, okay. um, my, my eyes hurt, my throat hurts, and I'm pretty sure my bloodstream is still 80% triples, one of the Belgians, uh, Belgian beers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, yeah, it's been an awesome trip. Okay, so that's, you know, I mean, you, you deserved all the celebrations, all the uh, applause and so on, because you pulled off something absolutely, absolutely amazing. And there is really a lot to unpack here, and I, I don't think we have, you know, enough time to unpack everything. But um, let's start with, like, a very basic question. Uh, Liam, I'll start with you. What, what were your expectations when you were going into that event? Like, did you feel like a powerhouse that you're going to dominate the event or was it rather, you know, maybe a black horse or maybe even an underdog? What, what, what say you? Well, um, I've really only been 
once before uh, to any event outside of the country, and that was the ETC in Serbia, uh, sort of the, the predecessor, so to speak, to the World Team Champions. And <clears throat> when I went there, I felt like um, I personally stood pretty well overall with some of the uh, other players in the world. Um, I played uh, Devin Swan at that event. I played Nick Nadavati at that event and players from all over the world, and I think I did well. And the team we brought this year was a really weaponized team, um, really, really some of the best players in Australia. The team dynamic was awesome and an absolutely weaponized team of coaches to support everyone. So going into this event, I, I, I was pretty confident. And I was confident because I felt we'd done the prep work, we'd done the, the team building, we'd done the list design. And so I, I went in pretty confident that we'd do really, really well. And um, I was still surprised that we did what we did, uh, despite being confident. I, I'm so happy with how the team did. I, I don't really have words for it. Yeah, I think when, when you're surprised, it, it tastes even better. Uh, the, Denise, what, what do you think? Uh, like, what, what were your... Yeah. Did you expect to win? Well, yeah, I mean, similar to Liam, my, my uh, ETC, WTC experience was limited. Um, this is the first... WTC, ETC I've done, um, but we had a very similar squad from about 2020, and because of COVID and stuff, it was you know put off for a long time. So, like a lot of countries, you know this this campaign was three years in the making, and we kind of had three years to make the best squad, the the dream team of Australia, if you call it that. Um, mm -hmm. And oh man, it was just such a well oiled machine. Like these eight players, I, I can't pick eight, I can't pick anyone that would have done a better job. And on, on my side, the coaching side, it was just amazing. And it was, um, look, I, I, it's definitely the best squad Australia's ever sent. Um, I think it may be the best squad Australia will ever send, but I'll, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed that we'll keep, we'll keep dominating. But um, mm -hmm. look, we, we went in and, and my, my ex, I don't want to say expectation, but my goal uh, for the team was to get to the podium. Um, if we won it, oh my God, that would have been like, if, if, if you told me on the flight there that, that Australia was going to win it, oh my God, <laughs> I, I, that I wouldn't even believe, even though I wanted to, to, to podium mm. so hard. Yeah. So I, I salute you mission accomplished. Absolutely. Yeah. Well done. I, Thanks I, so much, know. Tom. That's all <laughs> crazy. So yeah. uh, Denise, I'll, 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 uh, you know, grasp on the, the, the notion of, of coaching for a moment because yeah. I've been listening to to the normal blogs, uh, you know, since 2019. And in the most recent episodes, I've heard, and I, I know that you play Tau. Yes. I know that you're an active player. You played at the, um, like, team events. So I think that was ATC, also part yeah. of the preparation. Yeah, exactly. The, the part of the preparation for the WTC. Why a coach? Why not actually a, the driver behind Tau? Or uh, like yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting in Australia. We, especially in the city we live in in Brisbane, there are so many good players. Um, and you know, picking, getting one of those eight spots is is considerably difficult. Um, but me in the past, like I've had experience, you know, tutoring and teaching. I've had experience coaching national level sports teams. And there was, I, I kind of saw a while ago, there was a gap that we could fill in the coaching role in 40k. And I think a lot of countries. And, and we have a bit of hindsight after this WTC, but a lot of countries look at the coach as like a as like a water boy or like a yeah, yeah power like, boy. <laughs> similar to like a, a sports coach, but it's actually a bit different. Like the the best analogy I gave the team of four coaches we had is the the players are like Formula One drivers, and we're the pit crew, and we have to do everything we can to make sure those drivers or, or players. Um, are at their best, there's no obstructions in the way that we're efficiently getting everything done so they can just focus on the race or the game. Yes, and, and that's the way I... Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, the, and part of that is I, I thought I could add a lot of value as a coach. And look, I'm I, I'm a decent player, but I didn't hold myself to the level of being in the top eight personally. Um, I think there's other players better than me, but I definitely knew I could add value in that head coach role. So, um, and that's something I kind of piloted with, with the other coaches and we... I was I was really happy um, with how it turned out, and we had other teams coming to us saying, "Hey, you know what you guys are doing? We want to do it next year." So um, I think overall yeah. great success, um, and it's and we learned a lot from it. And I, th I think we'll get to it a bit later in the episode, but there was a lot that we kind of saw as like a, a coach meta, like you could you could almost deep dive on on kind yeah. of decision making and, and turning people on and off to to kind of rattle the cage a bit for the other team and that's something we can get into but uh, i loved it i loved every second of it mate 
Yeah. So, Liam, before we get to you, uh, I, one more question, because also I think, you know, that might have influenced the decision. Ducky or, well, Hayden Waldock is just an amazing player from what I hear. So, yeah. you know, he, you could, as a coach, you could be confident that he's going to do it. Oh, look, yeah, there was, and, and part of it is, you know, as without going on about it too much, as, as the coaches, you're paying a lot of money and you're putting a lot of time to go overseas and not play. So there's mm-hmm. a level of trust you need to have in the team. And I could not have, you know, put my faith in a, in a better squad of people. Um, these eight guys, we had ups and downs during the event, but all of them, you know, turned on when they needed to. And they were, it was so 100%. simple from the coaches end to, to kind of manage that. Right. Um, Liam, uh, a question to you. And again, I would like to try and understand that since, as I said, I've been listening to you guys since 2019. In 2019, I think you went to the EPC driving orcs, if I'm not mistaken. Megan Orcs, is, yeah. Like a selection of orc units then i remember you created an episode where you were talking about bringing 300 grots to a tournament or something like that <laughs> after that, that, you dropped, that happened yep that definitely right. happened after that you dropped the orcs and you from what i know uh, from what i remember you since that time you've been a uh, chaos enthusiast so like different flavors of chaos uh, i've heard the episode about the like the army of renown you know bellacor's disciples whatever thousands and your multiple successes and then what the fuck you bring necrons what happened <laughs> so um the, it's actually not that that interesting a story but um basically i i played the last iteration i suppose of my chaos sojourn was uh me playing thousand suns uh, and i played them for a while i took them to australia's team champs the atc and i did really well there but i, I felt like they were suffering a little bit with nephilim like we kind of got the rules a little bit early and I felt like they were suffering because whilst their secondaries were good, we were looking at like, you know, Tyranids and Sisters of Battle and even Black Templars and all these armies that were around that were making T-Sun's life hard. I actually um, got married on the 1st of May this year and I was on my honeymoon when the Nephilim secondaries dropped. Uh, luckily, mm-hmm. we were on a long road trip and that was my wife's turn to drive. So I, I, I spent a, pretty much a whole day on my honeymoon revealing Nephilim secondaries um, which I, I told her I was taking photos of the landscape, so that's never to leave this podcast. Um, so uh, I spent a long time deep diving the Nephilim secondaries, and the, the story behind me going to Necrons was basically in the span of like a week, right? The Nephilim secondaries leaked, then the points costs leaked, and then finally the balanced data slate leaked. And I remember when the Nephilim secondaries came out, I was like, wow, like these Necron secondaries are amazing maybe we should consider Necrons for WTC. <laughs> and then the points yeah. came out and I was like, wow, the King's only 400 points. This is awesome. Maybe we should consider the Necrons for WTC. And then the balance data slate came out and I was like, I am playing Necrons for WTC. <laughs> this, is, this is no longer a discussion. And I, um, I actually have a huge Necron army that I've had for a long time. I played them pretty much at the turn of the edition and they've been gathering dust for this, this whole time. Um, and that was kind of, I pressed the big red button, I dropped everything mm-hmm. chaos, and I, I jumped on the, the Necron train. Right. So you, you, you brought, and now this is, I think this will be a question to, to, to both of you in a way. Um, I, don't, I can't remember where I heard the story, probably on one of your podcasts, that um, during one of the previous ETCs, probably 2019, you went into singles playing your team's lists and that basically was a bad experience especially i think for eric who had sean naden sitting next to his table throughout the entire game basically spying on him checking what the list does i might be mistaken maybe that was someone else no no but, so right um, i i think i think in general one thing that um like, you know, if you listen to the normal blokes and a few other Australian podcasts, one thing that I think we take a lot of pride on um, in Australia is that our lists are typically odd. Um, mm-hmm. You know, 300 Gretchen, Mega Knobs, things like that. And I- I- even my Necron list, even though it's you know, got the king like everyone else, I played 27 Scarabs, which nobody else had at the event. A lot of Australian lists pride themselves on unique tech. And when when you go to an event like ETC or now WTC, every team puts in a huge amount of bookwork and, and footwork too, like walking around the event, seeing how things work, seeing how certain players are going. 
And we worked out in Serbia that it's undeniable that you do lose um, some of the power of unique lists if mm -hmm. you give people time to observe and watch. And that, that's actually not me saying that I think anybody else is a villain for watching you play. That's part of a public event. If you take a list to a public event, you are giving away how it plays. That, that, that's just the nature of 40K. And so um, <clears throat> Eric in Serbia played a, a gaunt, uh, Tyranid Termagaunt carpet. Yeah. And he was particularly unique in how he used lines of Termagaunts to stop movement and how he played that. And it was a unique approach to a Tyranid army. And so him playing it at singles, we think, uh, hurt him in the team's event. It changed how people paired into him. And so mm -hmm. this time, uh, sort of extrapolating, we, we made the decision um, that nobody was to play their team's lists in the singles event. And I, I stand by, that was, I, that was a frustrating but correct decision to make. So does that mean that you were practicing two lists before the event, or did, did you practice the team's event? Oh, sorry, the team's so, list. So that um, that's, that, 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 that's a funny question, Tom. Um, so what it actually meant was that I spent all of my time working on my team's lists, uh, our list, and roughly three hours before list sub, I realized I had, for singles, I had to come up with an entirely new Necron army. And so I spent, I spent about two of those three hours negotiating uh, with Eric, the captain, trying to work out what I could keep and what I couldn't keep in my list. Uh, <laughs> and eventually, much, yeah. I think he, he cracked the shits, which is fair enough, and said, uh, Liam, you just have to drop all of the Canoptech stuff. No raids, <laughs> no scarabs. And I was like, well, that's a, that's a thousand points of my army. So that, that, that's mildly problematic. So um, full disclosure, my, um, my singles list design basically involved me going upstairs to my, to my 40K cabinet, uh, working out what I could get painted to my standard, which is extremely low uh, in time, uh, and then submitting that list, um, which is pretty embarrassing, to be honest, uh, but it oh. ended up going okay. It's, it's not so embarrassing. Funny, I yeah, sorry, go on, Dini. Sorry, yeah. I just remember, Liam, you sent me a couple of lists, like, almost, like, an hour before list sub. And I'm like, Liam, these are all bad. I don't know why you're not taking a team's list. And, and, oh, and you, end honest, up winning, honestly, you end up winning the thing with it. <laughs> honestly, so when I submitted that singles list, like, for, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I basically dropped all of my scarabs and all of my raids for four ghost arcs filled with warriors. And in my head, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Like, you know, they're, they're transhuman and they shoot a lot of shots. But it turns out that Armor of Contempt is a thing. Mm. And it turns yeah. out that, um, yeah, ignoring AP1 is bad for an army that spams um, <laughs> strength for AP1. Uh, especially Thousand Suns was quite possibly the most horrific game I have ever mm -hmm. played in my life with that army. It was hard work. Yeah, but if you, if you, you know, to, if, if anyone whom you played at the event is listening to it right now, they are probably crying. <laughs> if you say that, you know, you basically put no preparation into playing, into preparing into singles, and then you just came and, you know, you just swept the floor with your army, then... Hmm. But, uh, but Tom, that, that, that's actually not fair. I, I didn't sweep the floor. So I, I, I won the event overall, but uh, as expected, um, I had some extremely tough games. Um, I played Devin Swan, and I lost. I, I lost nine to 11 points in that game when he was playing Thousand Suns. Because pretty early, right, in the event? Sorry? Pretty, pretty early in the event. Like, that was like the first uh, or second yeah, game, right? it was right? the third round. Um, or third, yeah. the third. So the last round on day one, I, I lost that round. And honestly, I felt I did everything that I could in a bad matchup. But I, I, as I expected, you know, with that list, there were just things that I couldn't do. I, I just couldn't kill Scarab Occult Terminators to save my life. There was nothing mm. I could do to solve that problem. Um, and, you know, similar situations when I played um, round one, I played Belgium's uh, sisters player. And once he got into combat with me um, and, you know, started engaging warriors, it was extremely hard for me to dig myself out. I, I had no melee units. So, you know, I, 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 I won overall, I suppose, but I did it by tiptoeing around armor of contempt lists and working really, really hard. Plus, mm -hmm. the thing is, is that even though I played with... Uh, warriors and ghost arcs the principle of how the list functions in that it overwhelms objectives with obsec and it uses the destroyers and the king as my big damage pieces that stayed the same between my teams mm -hmm. and my singles lists 
So even though I actually had practiced zero games with my singles list before this sub, I had played 50, 60, 70 games with my team's list. I knew Necrons inside and backwards, and I'd been playing against some of the hard meta armies the whole time. So a lot of the skills were transferable. So it, it, even though yeah. it sounds like I'm being super, su a super jerk uh, when I say that, I, I, yeah, I never said that. Necrons. <laughs> I said it. Right. I, I reckon he's a super jerk. <laughs> the so, so a question to you as a as a coach. When when uh, Liam was playing, what were you doing? So, were, were you, you know, have the tables turned? Were you the guy who now walked around the tables and saw what the other people are playing, or not 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 so much? Yeah, do you mean in singles? Yeah, in singles. Like, did yeah. singles give you any intel? Yeah. Well, I mean, some one of the cool thing things that we did is all the coaches that came along with us actually played the singles. So we had, you know, a bit of a bit of an opportunity to test our metal and um and, and see how it went. And there was a bit of intel gathered there. Um a lot of the players, I think three of our players, I think it was Liam Soley and Simon, played singles. So the other five players were there supporting and watching and it was it was kind of cool because the other five players were like our coaches. Um so they were getting us waters mm -hmm. and taking care of us. But um they were doing a lot of uh, scoping out of you know what other people were playing. Um, a number of uh, different national teams players were playing their teams list. Um, I played, you know, the French uh, Eldar player round one in, in singles, and he ran his exact same teams list, so that was interesting intel. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think using the singles as a as a way to to look at other lists is look, it's it's a valid tactic, and I think what we did at the end of the day was the right choice to to not play our teams list in that environment at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so. Uh... Liam, your account of the of the singles event. I mean, you you basically said that you know uh, hard fought battles and so on and so on. Uh, I don't know if we have the time to go through all the games, but maybe you can tell us something about how the last game went. You played Amy Paris and uh, his. Tip, what, tip. That's an overstatement if I say his list because that was like David Gaylard's list as far as I know, but Amy <laughs> Paris is an amazing player. So how did that game? I mean, we know how it went, but how did you play it out? Yeah, so um, playing Hamey was an awesome game, had a lot of fun, but it was a game that I've played before, um, not even in prep work. It was a game I'd played the day before. Um, even <laughs> though there are some differences between the Leviathan and Tyranid lists, by and large, that they were pretty common uh, across both singles and teams. And so when I played Hamey, I'd played uh, Innes um, the, the, the day before. Mm -hmm. um, I've played Simon, the Australian Tyranid player, 100 plus times. And so I know how everything in that list works. I know it inside and backwards. The flesh hooks are already like climbing up my back uh, mm -hmm. in certain matchups. Like I, I know what's going on. Basically, how the game panned out is, is you know, um, basically we played a diagonal deployment mission. I believe we played um, whatever sweeping clear is called now, Death and Zeal, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> it basically goes that Ghost Arcs move on to. All the middle objectives it takes them a little bit too long to kill ghost arcs and destroyers kill warriors so i was pretty happy that i went first i didn't do what i intended to and i actually didn't get any of the harpies in my first turn which is what i always try and do but what ended up happening was a unit of fully buffed up destroyers with hitting on twos of rerolls uh wounding on fours because they're transhuman with full rerolls to wound even with buffs, it kills almost an entire nine-man unit of Tyranid Warriors. And losing one of those units a turn is just too much damage for a Tyranid army to take. Yep. There was a really funny situation that I, I really want to um, highlight because it, it was on stream and it was so butt-clenching and so intense. I, I set up, using my destroyers, I set up a line of fire where I could kill a whole warrior unit, and I did. I got like eight of them out of nine, which I was really happy with. But it meant that the other warrior unit could theoretically charge me. Now, we, we pre-measured it. And if he got a six on his advance, it was going to be a nine-inch charge. I was mm -hmm. like, uh, 50, I was 23 inches away or something like that. Seven-inch move. Mm -hmm. And it goes to his turn and he rolls the six for his advance. And I'm like, oh, here we, here we go. Like, here, here, here it comes. This is definitely going to happen. And, you know, lo and behold, he rolled with a CP reroll. He, he got the nine-inch charge. And I was like, okay, like, you know, kudos, I killed, your I killed your warrior unit, and now, you know, vengeance, right? Yeah. So he got in, and he hit my destroyers, and he made me take crazy amount of saves, and he was in the right 
Tyranid Imperative so that sixes to wound are an extra AP. He made me take about 15 saves on a five up, and I passed a fair few of those. And then he made me take the six up saves. And we worked out that I had four saves to make on a six up. And if I passed any of them, the destroyer unit survived. And mm-hmm. we rolled them one by one. One, two, three. I didn't pass any of them. And I got to the last one. And I say to him, I hold the dice. And I go, I'd like to borrow one of your dice, mate. I'm going to roll a six on this save. <laughs> and I borrowed one of his dice. And I did. I, I, I didn't even need to see me re-roll it. I, I rolled the six. Uh, so the destroyer unit survived, and then I reanimated two of them, and so, so the unit survived. That, and that was a huge. That was a huge moment for the game. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it, I don't know if the destroyer unit dying just kills me, and, and if I lose the round. But bloody hell, does it help? I have no illusions about I that. Can it, helps a lot. Um, mm-hmm. it was a pretty. Att- I think he actually fell onto the floor. I think you can see it on stream <laughs> from memory. Uh, Amy <laughs> lay down on the ground and said, "You've killed me, man! You've killed me!" And it, it was it was pretty funny. It was it was a very we had a really awesome dynamic. Amy is one of the best sports I've ever played. Okay, that's that's fantastic to hear. I I, I heard only good things about him, so I'm happy yeah. that you actually you know managed to play him in the final and that it went the way it went. Um, all right, uh, the knee. Uh, a question that I have for you. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, I spoke about the, the opportunities that, that, that potentially came from the single event. But now when we move to, on to the, to the team's event, um, as you said, your, your lists are very non-standard. I mean, you were one of the few teams that took Gene Steeler cults. And as I mentioned in the like, pre-show conversation, not only was it Gene Steeler cults, so one of the least popular armies of the event was also the least popular combination of Gene Steeler cards because it was yeah. like a myriad of cards and so on. Um, so what made you make those choices? And maybe, you know, maybe you can speak about this GSC list a little bit and then about the overall team composition. Yeah, I think um, one thing that the team did, and, and look, before we started, definitely was not me calling the shots on the team lineup. It was uh, the players and Eric, uh, captain. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think for a while, we kind of had a list of what were the eight factions that we we want to bring or need to bring. And, and that changed, especially with Nephilim. You know, that, that threw a lot of things around. And we actually had, Liam, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric was looking at like either GKT Sons or GSC as like our eighth pick list. Yeah, he was looking at um, a bunch of different things. Yeah, and even Marines, like we were exploring Space Marines as well. Um, but we kind of landed on GSC because it, I mean, it's Eric. It, it, it fits his, the way he plays. He can he can mm-hmm. make anything just crazy and unexpected. But the amount of raw damage that list can do, um, and and it's it's got so many weird resilience points. Like it's baby transhuman, the bikes have a feel no pain. You get D3 bloody bikes back a turn. Like it's, <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous because you can, if you under commit to those units, you're fucked. Like you're straight fucked. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And he can set up these amazing turns where, you know, a turn two or turn three, you can just deal so much crippling damage. And that not only swings the game, but it like rattles the person because they don't expect it. And there were mm-hmm. like one of the coaches who was on Eric's table just had to have the, the iPad with the GSC codex out because we were like, <laughs> there's going to be a turn where the opponent like realizes what's happening to them. And they're either going to trigger or they're either going to be like, oh, I need to read this codex. And you look at the codex and you just see the light leave their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like, it was, honestly, I GSC was one of the the best performing. You know, I think Eric got, Liam, you got first overall in the in the teams by score. I think Eric was fourth out of out of oh, all the players. With Think's GSC, yeah. So he was our... He was our second high scoring player, like it's next to Necron. So, you know, the, the list performed. Um, Eric, Jez, and Soli were doing our pairings, and they were you know, amazing at pairings. Um, and the GSC just rocked everyone's world. Like, I, I think a lot of people just didn't expect it. Even when we were playing the lovely, lovely Polish team, they were kind of looking at the list going, okay, what, what does it do? Who do we put into it? And and the sisters player who was, who was um, playing into it, same kind of thing. Like, probably knew what was a bit of what was going on, but when Eric hit, it just blew blew the army away. Yeah, yeah I, I think everyone was caught by surprise. But even the, the you know the guys on the Polish team, they, they, they were saw called the list. Sorry, come again. <laughs> they were called ambushed. They were called ambushed. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, uh, again, kudos for like you know awesome list building uh, that mm. took everyone by surprise. 
Okay. So, uh, again, that will be a question to both of you, so, so you choose who goes first. Um, how did Team Australia prepare or, or, or train? Like, did you, I understand you, you, you play in Teams events, but do you, for, yeah, for example, do you use TTS? Because that TTS was, was huge in Poland and a huge yep. part of preparations. Do you do the same? So, um, from a from a player's perspective, uh, pr pretty much no. Um, I think very few of the playing eight. I I've used TTS and played in some events in the past, but not for any WTC prep. Um, and the main reason for that is that even though Australia is a freaking ginormous country, we have quite concentrated pockets of players in the major cities. So, like for example, I, I live a 10, 15 minute drive from Eric, who lives about a four meter walk from Simon. Um, I live very close as well. Like uh, Hayden Walduck lives um, down the Gold Coast, which is about 30 minutes away. So there were quite a lot of weekends where we had four, five members of the WTC team in Eric's backyard playing games. So quite mm -hmm. a lot of the prep work was done in person over barbecues. Um, and in terms of prep work, you know, I had a really, really good chat with my Polish opponent as well. And it's really interesting and fascinating for me to listen to how other teams approach team building, uh, mm -hmm. how you select the team. There's, I've heard about the, the complexities of how France picks their team and how other teams focus on, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Poland focuses on what lists are needed and then who plays those lists to the highest caliber. I think Australia is the exact opposite of Poland in that... Mm -hmm we pick the players and then the players themselves decide which list enables them to do their job the best. So for example, in a team's environment, my role, whether it's at a state level or, or over in WTC, my role is typically to go into favorable matchups and get big wins. That, that's always been sort mm -hmm. of my role. So I built a list to do that. Eric's job is to dive on grenades that nobody else wants to see and get as and many points, points as possible. Yeah. And so he built a list to do that. And so approaching it that way kind of enables us to be 100% confident in ourselves, in our lists and in our factions, because you're given a job and it's up to you to work out how to do that to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I can add, it adds a bit of ownership as well and responsibility to the player because they're playing something suited to them rather than jumping on a list that, uh, you know, is a bit more of a cookie cutter. Yeah. Uh, and onto the TTS, bit, because that, that is actually a question that, uh, you know, that the guys in the Polish Discord asked me to ask. So mm -hmm. do, is there a culture of, of using TTS for, you know, practice games, uh, collecting intel, what, what have you? I think... Um, uh, me and Liam both, you know, played played a a fair bit of TTS. I think I played a bit more than Liam uh, during the pandemic. And uh, yeah, you did. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> I logged about like 150 TTS tournament games, but um, like something silly. But um, I, I think TTS has its benefits if you can't meet in person. But I I think having seen both, I think playing a lot of TTS made me a little bit sloppy on the table. Uh, okay. I think playing a lot of TTS is not as good as in life practice either. Um, there's there's some nuances that you don't have with a tape measure um, versus you know a measuring ruler on TTS. So it's I think um, getting used to all the auras and distances and stuff being measured very easily on TTS can or what I found and what some of the other team members found um, can make us a little bit sloppy. So we we didn't really use it at all for the WTC prep, um, but but individuals in our team have played on it before. Yeah. Okay. And um, did you collect or uh, did you spy on other teams? I'll ask like straightforward question. Did you, you know, did you have any intel on what others might be bringing I or mean, what, you know? Yeah, look, I mean, it would be silly to not look at other teams. Like it, it would mm -hmm. be silly to not um, go in with all the information. So I think Liam, you can you can take it a bit. We we did see a few things. Yeah. So by and large, um, unfortunately, from Australia, it's a little bit difficult for us to go have a bit of a gander at like Bay Area Open in the US. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I can't walk down to home nations and just have a gander at the list. It, it's a little bit more challenging for us. Um, but, you know, when we see um, lineups of players, especially from certain countries, it's fair to look at their singles performances and see roughly what they might be playing. Um, Any specific and countries? In mind? Well, like, like the, the United States. Um, like, mm -hmm. like, but, but by and large, I, I can look and go, hey, 
the interesting thing about the US was we, we looked at it and we saw they had four Blood Angel players. Um, we were like, there can only be one. Like, what's, <laughs> what's, what's going on here? Like, something And the one fishy. Blood Angels list was not played by the Blood Angels player. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, like, there, there are um, also, you know, for example, players like uh, Ines Wilson, he's got a reputation for being an excellent Tyranid player. Um, in Sweden, they had a very well-known Admech player. And so a lot of those armies have quite fixed builds. And so we could yeah. look at BCP, see their singles lists and go, I can say with a reasonable level of confidence that a variant, something pretty close to this, is going to be at the WTC. Um, we need to have an answer for it. The other mm -hmm. thing that I think was a bit more, um, that we, I think we actually underestimated it, uh, Team Australia did, was how prevalent knights and chaos knights were going to be. And I, I say that because even though they're doing okay from a singles perspective, I haven't really seen Knights and Chaos Knights absolutely obliterate the meta overall, especially here especially here in Australia. Um, knights do okay in singles, but are a bit of a gatekeeper army that people sort of have to overcome to get on the podium. It's reasonably rare for any of them, either variant, Chaos or Imperial, to, to be on the podium. Um, and so that was something that surprised me. No, no matter how much BCP trawling I did, um, lying in bed at night, uh, looking at all of these lists from all over the world, I, I did not expect 50% of the teams to have both variants of Knights. Um, and I, that that surprised us a little bit. It created okay. a bit of a pairings issue when a team had two yeah. Knight armies and a Tau army. It's like, wow, someone's catching something bad on a light table. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that was a problem for Team Australia. Okay. Now, um, you know, how before we get to your actual like, matchups and games, uh, uh, how did you spend the time after list publication? So, you know, the lists became, to some, they were they were published in BCP. Some people waited for the PDF to be published with all the armies. Like, did this intensify your preparations or or what happened? Yeah, so, um, Denis, do you mind if I take this one? Go for gold, mate. So, um, when lists got released on BCP, um, to put it in perspective, I think they came out at about 5.30 a.m. or something in Australia based on, like, time zones when they were released. Um, I set an alarm. Uh, I was awake at 6. And I, 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 I was looking at lists pretty quick smart. So we have, uh, you know, nothing unique. I'm sure a lot of teams do. We had a, a uh, Excel spreadsheet that was live for everyone to edit where you would rate your matchups, standard stuff based on you know, colors and, and predicted scores. And we did that individually, um, sort of without outside input, because again, a lot of the Australian approach to this is quite individualistic in that you've created your list, you have your role, you have to back yourself. And so I actually really love that because if I say, hey, I'm going to get 14 points in this game, Eric and Jeremy and Matt Morizoli, who were doing pairings, they go, okay, we trust Liam to get 14. That was the end of the discussion. Um, and same thing for the other players. So. Once we did our own scores, that was where me personally kind of took my hands off the wheel a little bit, and it was up to our pairings team to spend dozens and dozens of hours doing simulations. And what mm -hmm. that means for us is that one of our other players um, pretends to be, um, you know, the other team's captain, and we just use their lists in pairings. Um, so, you know, we, we did, <clears throat> in our pod, uh, we did, dozens of simulations for the people in our pod. We did dozens for America and England and Poland and France and Germany. And so we had worked out paths to victory for pretty much every team. And we'd also highlighted problems, like when we did pairings and we worked out, hey, it's going to be like an 80-80 draw if our numbers are correct. Um, yeah, so look, to be honest, so much of this work is done by our pairings team. Uh, so much data is collected. So many simulations are done, either over the phone or in person. So mm -hmm. many hours of work. Yeah, but what Denise said earlier, that uh, your method of, of building the team where you choose players and then, you know, the players choose the armies, I think from what well, you make it sound like this makes the lives of the, of the guys who are responsible for pairings that much easier because in the sim at the simulation stage, they just know they can trust you. Like if you say, yeah. I'll bring 14, yeah. they don't have to question that. They don't have to, you know, 
look into that. They just trust you. So it, there's a, there's and, a level and, of ownership and, that comes exactly. with it, which is, yeah. A hundred percent. It's like, you know, you go back to that question for like Eric on GSC, for example. D do I believe that as a codex, GSC is one of the best armies in the game? Personally, no. But do I believe that Eric playing GSC makes it one of the best armies in the game? Hell yes. Mm. And so when Eric says, I'm going to get 15 points in this game, I don't go, oh, Tyranids about Are you GSC. sure? Yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't ask the question. The question is, I know he's played 100 games at GSC. I know he knows the book inside and backwards. You can trust and believe in him. And from his perspective, that's the same for the whole team. When yeah. somebody says, hey, I'm playing into Brees's Tower list, which was an, an abomination. Oh it was God. so terrifying <laughs> to look at. Mm -hmm. um, it was like you know, 17 Tower tanks and flyers and nonsense. When somebody looks at that and goes, I'm going to get one point. He's like, okay, fair enough. I, I look forward <laughs> to seeing one on the score sheet. No worries. Like, that's it. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the chat. Yeah, it could be that one point that makes the difference. But, you know. Yeah, um, I can tell you what, yeah. there were so many moments like that. Like even in the, the round, the final against Poland, so one of our players brought back three points in, in a game that I thought they were going to get a zero. I nearly cried. I was like, "Yes, three points, come well, on!" Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you could see, I think, and this is maybe a time to to mention this as well. I can't remember the last time I wasn't playing, but I was so excited for the game. Like the game between Poland and Australia, we had, I don't know, about 60 people in the Discord, probably more, about 60 people actively typing. And they were just posting like Polish flags and oh, go Poland. And then you know, they were like uh, crossing their, 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 their fingers and so on. And, and they were, everyone was waiting for the actual scores to come in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone That's was like counting. Uh, so we need 27 more out of three <laughs> games. So if he brings seven and he brings nine, then we are left with, uh, can we do it? Can we not? It was intense. It was crazy. So everyone was waiting for for your scores. And then, you know, at, at, at some point I was looking at the Discord and I had the, the French Wargaming uh, stream in the background, but not looking at it. And at some point, you know, people were speculating how many more points we need. And there was like, yeah, like, a, you know, like a, an outburst of, of joy. And I was like, is it Poland? Is it Poland? Fuck, it's not Poland. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, what a pity. What a pity. But yeah, but yeah, it was it was so so let's listen how you actually got there. Um I don't know who wants to go first, but can you maybe tell our listeners about your first matchup? What was it? Who were you playing? How did it pan out? Yeah. Um, I guess, do you want to go by days, Liam? Or actually, no, we'll just we'll just go by matchups. There's, the first part of WTC is a bit of a blur for me because uh, the <laughs> second, the, the tail end of it was where like the peak stress kind of hit. Um, but on day one, we had the pods uh, pod stage, so we had Greece, Finland, and Warhammer unfighted. Um, I guess in the the Greece and Finland rounds. Um, it was, I mean, pretty straightforward. I don't, re I'm not going to lie, I don't remember a massive amount, but uh, our pairings team kicked it out of the park. Um, some of our players had, um, you know, had a, had a bit of a uh, bit of first round jitters. Um, we had to throw poor Matt Jackson under the bus of the Greek tower list, and it was horrific. Um, mm -hmm. And then Liam, you, what did you get day one? Like a nineteen, a twenty, and a nineteen? Um, not yeah. So um, I played. Oh man. Uh, Militiaditis. Well, um, that's bad. I, I'm so sorry. I, I have, I have, I have. You did your best. Name. I am very sorry. Yeah. He was an absolute gentleman and a scholar. I played Greece's Necron army. So, you know, uh, this act. This is actually a running gag uh, in Serbia. Uh, round one, I played orcs against orcs, um, and I come to Belgium and I play Necrons against Necrons. Round one. So it's becoming a bit of a theme. Mm -hmm. um, and it was basically a case of um, what happens if you take 1,200 points of Necron characters versus what happens if you take 1,200 points of Scarabs. Um, and the answer is primary is good. Um, it was a pretty rough game for my opponent uh, because, you know, Catan powers into Scarabs just feel bad. Mm -hmm. um, and we played... By whatever vital is called now, I really should know the data names scry. of the new missions. It's, it's a bit insulting. Yeah. Whatever vital intelligence is now called, like data scry salvage or something, 
Um, and because the objectives are sticky, and that if you hold them in your command phase, you can move off them, it basically meant that my huge blob of scarabs uh, just kind of went up the table and then went across the table until he was in his deployment zone with just scarabs and raids, everything. He mm -hmm. almost he almost tabled me, killed all my models, but it was 100 to uh, 52, I think was the score, 19-1 in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah, he just couldn't make up the loss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think okay. I, I've just got the scores up for that round. We um, we got up against Greece, 118 to 42. So it was uh, our biggest win. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we, funnily enough, I think when we played Greece, the list that all our players practiced against the most was probably the Greek tower list, right? Yeah, yeah. Like 100%. we were all, I reckon, fifty percent of everyone's practice games was against the Greek talus because our matrix on that was just horrific. It was just like red, 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 orange, red, red, mm -hmm. yellow, red. <laughs> so, so you um, knew that you would have to sacrifice someone, probably. Yeah. yeah, we we had we had a pin for it with with two of our players, but even that little pin that we had it was not that good. So we ended up just I think Eric just ended up not caring and just we got the knights into it. And shit happened. <laughs> someone um, was going to be sacrificed to the long strike god. They were they were going to be sacrificed. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, but it went well. Yeah, no, it was a good round. So what about the next one? So I'm just bringing so up the, the summary. Round two, we, had... we played Finland, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So in that round, um, overall, we were really, really happy um, with how we did. I think we got up 105 to 55. So yes. a, a very big win round two for Team Australia. And... It was really good from our perspective because even though we'd done a lot of the prep work, I think a lot of our players needed the momentum. Um, yes. And, you know, for a few of our players, one of our absolute weapon players, Chris Wright, has never been out of the country before to play a 40k event. Mm. And so, uh, you know, and he was, um, you know, he'd done all the prep work and put in all the hard yards, but this was sort of the momentum that I think he needed to really show that he deserved to be there, as we all knew he did. Yeah, it's not um, a coincidence, yeah. You know, I... Um, I ended up playing uh, Sammy, who I don't think is Finland's captain, but he, he managed their pairings and did a pretty good job of the pairings from their perspective. Um, and I'd spent a lot of time as a Necron player um, getting ready to play Hail of Doom Craft Worlds. I, I was really, really ready. I've played, I think, about three out of four of the WTC team play Eldar. And so I, I was very experienced with them practicing it into me. And that was a, a big 20, 20 zero win for me against Sammy in that round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think looking at, um, I guess, the, the makeup of our team, there were some trends that we saw along a lot of the rounds. Um, we had Liam on Necrons, Eric on GSC, and Chris on Eldar. They're usually our big swingers. Like, they're the ones getting us our big points. Um, we had our three, not, not really shield, but more classic, you know, scrappy, you know, like fire blanket style players of, of Jeremy on sisters, Matt Morisoli on Drakari, uh, and Simon on his nids, who were really there to like scrap in the long games. And they were usually the games that were finishing up at the end. Um, so they were kind of the late end. And then we had our two more swingy or, or versatile lists in our Knights and Tau. So when we when we were looking at a round from at least a, a coaching point of view, we see Eric, Liam, Chris getting these big wins. We see you know, Jeremy solely jumping on these harder matchups, keeping scores nice and low. Same with Simon. And then we see one of either our Knights or Tower kicking something out of the park. I was like, oh, cool, we've won the round. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, everything was just falling into place. And I think, uh, I, I forgot to mention this, but uh, to our listeners, that might be actually beneficial. Uh, I will be posting the link to the lists uh, in, like, below the, the video. And especially if you're interested in the Australian list, you don't really have to go that far. They are at the top, the, the very top of the of the file. So easy to find. Go and see what the, you know, the, the reigning champions of the world have brought to uh, the event. What was your third game or third so, matchup? Yeah, so our third, um, third opponent was Warhammer Undivided, which is the Merc team with some, you know, other players from other countries who uh, couldn't represent uh, various reasons. Um, right. Our very own um, Adam Kamaliri, a.k.a. Vladim Kamalinsky, was on this team. <laughs> um, <laughs> so okay. he, he played as a GK player. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, it was interesting playing against another Australian. Um, it was, yeah, it was but... really weird. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that was that was great. But um, look, this was 
this ended up being one of the trickier rounds of our day one. There, there was a world where, you know, we were we were losing to these guys, um, and okay. we we paired into them. Pairings went fairly well. Um, we had a projection of a hundred points in pairings, so we projected a big win, and then two games just went really south. Um, one of them was a game a game against a uh, previous Russian player, uh, Alexander Kodmakov, I think his name is. An incredible player. Liam, I think you've played him before. Um, I, I played him in singles in Serbia. He's r- excellent, excellent 40K player. Yeah, he's, he's very good. Um, so that game went south, and that sent our projection down. Another game dropped, and, and that sent us down to an 82, which was terrifying, <laughs> really terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, but then a few of the boys really swung hard, and, um, you know, with, um, I guess... Uh, Matt Matt Morisoli's Drakari and 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 Matt Jackson's Matt Jackson played against another Talist and it was turn two tabling of all the nights. Um, so those two games going down were, were tricky to manage. But then um, Eric just turned around and was like, "I'm getting a big win," and just slapped. <laughs> so uh, same, same I, with Liam. I, I have to I have to step in here and I need to ask because the Tau player was from Poland. Yes, and we had him in the Polish Discord, and. Like I think out of all the games he played, he maybe played four times against Knights. Uh, Attic, if you're listening to this correctly, in the comments. But he was like, every single time when that happened was, and they did it again. They paired the Knights into me. What the fuck? So yeah. why did you pair Knights into Tau? What was the reason? Right. I, I can't speak for Eric and, and Jez and Soli because they they do they know the pairings more than me. But, but yeah. sometimes with the Knights, there, there is an opportunity to swing that game versus mm-hmm. if the Knights don't have a good matchups elsewhere, if they have a potential 50-50 into the Tau, we could roll them in, they soak up the Tau, and then we, number one, we get the Knights out of our matrix mm-hmm. and we give our team an option to destroy the Tau. Usually it doesn't work, but if someone's going to cop the Tau... Um, it may as well be the ones that could, could smash them. Do you have any more insight on that, Liam? Well, I think that one of the things that we encountered, and this is a, a real learning point for Team Australia, is that because we only had one Knights list and a lot of other teams had two Knights lists, it kind of meant that we were unable to use our Knights offensively in that you yes. couldn't put both up to take favorable tables. Yes. And so... Unlike other teams, we, in many games, ended up using our knights defensively to sort of take bad games for other people. Like, for example, for me as a Necron player, I hate Tau. I hate Tau very much. Tau can go die in a hole. Um, (laughs) And so when I was looking at my matchups, pretty much every team was seven good games and one bad game. And so in terms of achieving our roles as eight players... When Eric and Matt and Jeremy were doing pairings, they were, wow, like, you know, Liam really doesn't want to play this Tau game. Let's put Jackson up. The Tau player will probably take the Chaos Knights as a player. And, and, and that's ended up, or vice versa, if we got the choice, we put the Tau into our Knights because it took it away from everyone else. And there was a world where Knights win that game. Knights is one of those armies where if you roll good, you're going to win. Um, and that's kind of the, the reality of what we lent on. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's that's valuable insight. Listen, Team Poland, you'll learn something. How to take the first place next time. Um, all right. So that was the end of, of day one. Um, you, 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 you won that. And then I guess we are getting to the most interesting part of the event. So day two, who did you play and how did it go? So uh, I'll, I'll let me take Sweden, Liam, and then you can take USA, hey? Sounds good. Oh, excuse me. Um, so yeah, day day two. So round four, we had Sweden first in the morning. Um, we didn't expect to to play them, you know, so early on. So we we had a bit of time the night before doing the matchups. Um, look, it was it was tight at times, um, but a few things like really really went our way. Um, we ended up getting it was a closer win, um, but still fairly comfortable at ninety two to sixty eight for us against Sweden. Um, one of the big things that we were kind of Looking at is, um, you know, they had a couple of star players. They had Rickard Nielsen, who is a very well-known Admech player. Um, lovely gentleman, and Liam played him. Um, and we we knew what that list could kind of do. Uh, like, the Americans had an Admech list as well. Um, and we were we were lucky that we got Liam into that game. And essentially, if you correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Liam, you pretty much spent the whole game pinning in the Admech in their deployment zone. You just had the board, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, um, so you know, that was a that was a big twenty for us in a game that could have potentially spiraled. Um, we got Matt Jackson into the Imperial Knights mirror, and then you know, Chris, Ducky, Simon, Eric, Jez, and Soli, all of them had really tight, scrappy games. So, you know, it ended up being a lot of like 10, 12, 13s, and then one big blowout with Liam, um, and that secured the ninety two. So, you know, it, it could not have gone gone better. Yeah, Sweden is is no joke. So, like, yeah, the the, the way you played it out is. Um, yeah. Um, w- w- without taking too much of your time, Tom, I actually wanted to shout out Ricard, who I played some awesome players at the event, both skill level and sportsmanship wise. Um, Ricard 100% takes the cake for my favorite opponent. That's not saying anything bad about my other opponents, but he was just such a gentleman. He is the most by intent 40k player I have ever played. He was smiling. He was laughing the whole game. We bought each other a beer after the round. We traded shirts. We traded dice. Added me on Facebook. He's an absolute legend. Like honestly, such a nice dude. Yeah, that, that's actually you know what Warhammer for k should be about. That's exactly the essence of what we are trying to get in this hobby. So if everyone, if you can all be like Rickard, please do because that's the the, the role model to follow. Well, well to be a better place. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, so that was Sweden. Uh, you came out victorious. Who was next? Round five. Um, the, the big showdown we've been doing quite a lot of work for um, USA versus Australia. So going into this round, I, I think um, one of the things that is really palpable playing at WTC is you know the reputation of the teams and and the players behind it. And, you know, I, th- I think it's undeniable with, um, you know, Art of War and the amount of content that comes out of the U.S. that the Americans have a reputation for being good players. And so it's hard, you know, going into this round to not feel a little bit of the old thump thump in the chest, you know, get, mm. getting a bit nervous. And, you know, I think that that really um, is a palpable weapon that, you know, needs to be accounted for. So in this round, um, spoiler alert, we ended up drawing and we ended up drawing to be honest, by the skin of our teeth. Uh, we got 76 oh, yeah. points to 84. So we, we, you know, I think we drew by two points um, just. So we, we, we got in with a draw there. It was a really, really tough round for a couple of our players and um, like especially our scrappy players who like, for example, uh, Jeremy Martino and Matt Morozzoli who are world-class point scorers in bad matchups had mm-hmm. things that went horribly wrong and cemented losses so that that was pretty that was pretty tough but we also had some hard fought wins uh, Hayden Waldock got a 12-8 against Brandon Grant and um, much to I think a round of beers and uh, yelling applause uh, Simon our nid player beat Richard Siegler uh, 13-7 which we were absolutely stoked about um, Eric got a 12-8 into Brad Chester which was awesome uh, and I got a big 19-1 into Anthony Vanilla, which was yet another Tyranid player playing Leviathan that I played again. It happened a mm-hmm. lot throughout the weekend. Um, but, you know, big wins on the American side. Jack Harpster got a 19-1 into to Matt Morizoli. Uh, and equally, uh, John Lennon got a 19-1 into Jeremy Martino. Yeah. So, you know, th- there were a lot of games that were high scoring, either one way or another. But mm-hmm. I'd say four out of eight of the games were 19-1s. Yeah. Uh, and then four out of eight games were 12 eights. So it was a really right. tied round the whole way through. But the Americans just got a few more points than us um, throughout the round and did very well overall. Um, mm-hmm. and it, I was, I was going to say, if, if I can add, um, you know, there was a point in that round that our projections, I think we projected about an 85. So we projected into draw, draw territory, which meant a few players really had to push. So kind of Eric and Liam kind of turned turn the gas on quite early. Um and, and one thing that we saw is is that started to really sh- rattle the cage for the USA coaches. And they were like, oh, my God, we need to we need other people to score. And then, you know, Jack Harpster versus Matt Morisoli, that blew out. John Lennon versus yeah. Jeremy Martino, that blew out. And they felt a bit more comfortable. And I remember the, the conversation with those boys. And they're both like, oh, I'm probably getting 20, probably getting 20. And we, the coaches kind of came together and said, hey, if we can get a few points out of these two games, it takes the pressure off like Simon and Liam in, in the good games. Um, so we, we just went to those guys saying, hey, bring us back one or two and it'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just bring us back a couple of points. And 
Jeremy and, and Jeremy Martino and Matt Morosoli bringing back one point each was part of the difference between us losing that round and getting a draw. So, yeah, you know, it just goes to show, like, those scrappy players that can get in there and get something out of a bad game matters so much for the final result. Because if we were two points less, we lose a round. Yeah, but that's all, that also shows, to again, to our listeners who are maybe not that familiar with the, with the, with the uh, team concept of Warhammer 40k, in the, the, the eight-player teams, you don't play necessarily to win. You play to gain points, and every single point is so crucial, so vital to the overall score of the team. It's not always about winning. Sometimes it's taking, you know, uh, one for the team, but then bringing one for the team, and yeah, that you be that one that changes the overall result. Yeah, it just gets you gets you a little bit closer to win or draw territory. You know, it, it matters so much. Exactly. So, Denise, uh, I'll 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 pause here again to talk about matchups because uh, I, I wanted to touch out of sheer curiosity upon something else, and that is uh, managing stress. So during during you know an event like that, especially that you said that you had a guy on the team who has never traveled outside of the of the country before to play in a 40k event. Suddenly, you have the pr- prospect of playing celebrity playing people who are so well known and so on. What was your role and what how did the team basically manage that un- undoubtedly stressful situation? Yeah. Oh yeah, man. And it's um you know it's this is for for a lot of guys in the team, myself included, it's one of the the highest performing, you know, sport or, you know, gaming things they'll ever do. You know, it's it's at the highest level of something they love. And if they love it, they're going to be nervous, you know, then it's good to be nervous because it means you care. Of course, it means you care about the result. It means you care about what you're doing, but that needs to be managed. And I think one of the big things that made managing it easier for us is, is we were 100% a team of 12. Um, it wasn't eight players and four coaches. It wasn't one captain, seven players, a head coach, three coaches. It was a unified brick of 12 and that was palpable in terms of you know how we how we conducted ourselves how we supported each other my general rule within the coaching staff is there is nothing negative to be said you know when players lose games that's okay these things happen we stay positive we're not going to implode because something bad's happened we are keeping morale up and we are patting everyone on the back congratulating them for little little achievements you know and one of the big things that helped unite us is is eric you know our captain he's Small in stature, a young in age, but a fearless leader. And you know, every every round when we got together and did our big Aussie 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 chant, um, you know, and and brought the team together, all that stuff matters. And I think <laughs> part of the part of the one of the things that kept the team, um, you know, in good spirits was actually the the level of of banter that was thrown around, not just between us, but at our opponents. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a few yeah. a few great calls that I probably won't repeat here that we uh, we got with. No, feel and, free, uh, feel free. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, look. I mean, there's a video of Tiffus sucking a toe that uh, you know is probably going to go public. So um, it has. Yeah, we we threw down the gauntlet, and um, you know, a lot of a bunch of teams uh, accepted. But that kind of even during pairings, that kind of jovial banter helped to lighten things up, and you know, not remove the stress, but just realize that you know we're all playing with the same models the same rules we play this game in our backyard or at the game store with our friends every mm-hmm. weekend although there's stakes on the table here this is no different to that game you're playing at home so uh, and, that that helped and look I, I couldn't have couldn't have thought of a better team of guys to, to to be with as a team and I think it really showed Liam we talk about this a lot but there's a big difference between a team of champion players and a champion team a hundred percent and you know just kind of building on what Denise said I think one thing that I cannot highlight enough is how important it is to have that pit crew. You know, we spoke mm-hmm. about it in the airport coming home um, in that I think the expectation for the Australian team going forwards is that we need three, four coaches to come to this event because it meant that I had someone in between my table. Like they, the coaches were organized. They set it up so that an Australian coach would be allocated two tables and that coach would ser- sort of serve those two tables, both watching the games, getting judges, getting water, getting snacks, whatever needed to be done, getting rules, finding FAQs. They were there the whole time. And it meant for me, when I was playing people with tough reputations, like when I played Ricard, and I've played some AdMech players before that have just blown me out of the water. When I was playing Ricard, you know, I, I-, I felt the stress. I felt like things were going well. But, you know, um, 
uh, a coach was always there. You have a friend by your side the whole time. I don't need to ask for a judge or rules because if something goes awry, uh, they can just go and do that. That support crew helps alleviate that stress so much because it means that every ounce of the 40K player can just focus on the game. There's no yes, that, that's extremely removing the hurdles. To worry about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, so that was the game against the United States. Uh, yeah. What team came next? England. Right. right. So, you, to, to be perfectly honest, your way to the top was like probably one of the hardest possible. <laughs> yeah. If you think about it, it we, was um, fucking ridiculous, bro. We, <laughs> we, it was, we, we definitely. So, put, put, put it this way, right? You know, I think anyone who plays the United States, um, who, who brings a team that puts in all the work, they go, we have to win this round. We, we're we're going to fucking do it. Like, we're going we're gonna to win it. And when we drew, even though it was a good result against an amazing team, it was a little bit demoralizing in some ways. And so Eric and the coaches did such an awesome job to rally everyone together and go, okay, there is now the English team right after we played the United States, right after we draw it. We need to dig deep and we need to fight hard this round. And I'm, I'm really, really proud of how we did in that round. Um, uh, so, you know, when we played England, end of day two, a lot of people are exhausted. Some idiots decided to play uh, eight round singles event uh, beforehand <laughs> as well, which was a, a, an excellent choice by many of us. If you've seen the meme of me, I'm pretty sure my soul had left my body by this point. <laughs> I, I was absolutely done with playing 40K. Um, so uh, Australia v England, we... So Australia v England, I think in general... One of the th things that I want to highlight here is that we think we paired pretty poorly based on our Excel spreadsheet in England. There were some big chunks of orange and red in that spreadsheet for bad matchups. And I want to highlight how well, how amazingly our pairings team did in this round to get us the results that we did. So England has some excellent players and we ended up winning. Um, we, we won that round uh, 95 to 65. Um, and we, we got overall what we felt was about six favorable matchups overall, which is, honestly, I, I don't understand what sort of Rain Man, Zach Galifianakis trickery these people, <laughs> like, like, I don't understand the maths, the memes that went into this, but it, it worked. Um, and so, you know, I, I ended up playing um, like Josh Roberts, a uh, Blood Angel player who Eric played in... Um, Serbia last time, I got a big 20-0 into the Blood Angels. Eric played James Ramsey on their Necrons, uh, big 20-0. Chris Wright played Mike Porter, a big 18-2. So, uh, you know, all three of the sort of the, the, the big hitters that are supposed to get big scores got what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And our scrappy players, the people who fight for points, Matt Morazzoli, 10-10 draw. Jeremy Martino, 11-9. Um, Simon Djokovic versus Manny Chima, 10-10 draw. Um, so, you know, like all of the scrappy players did their jobs. All the big hitters did their jobs. The really the, um, the one really tough game was Hayden Walduck and uh, Alex Harrison. Hayden got zero and Alex Harrison got the big 20. I, I think overall we underestimated how awesome that Freeblade Lance night list is. It did really, really well. He absolutely um, smacked it out of the park. Alex Harrison mm -hmm. did an awesome job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so about this team uh, earlier... When we were when when you were like describing your preparations and so on, uh, and some matchups, you said that there are teams where you can, by their singles performance, you can pretty much say how they are going to pair in teams. Would you say that England is one of those teams where you know because I think they play more singles than they do teams. Uh, I I don't know what their preparation is. Hopefully, I can get them on on the podcast to find out. But would you put them in the same basket as you put? Uh, the United States, for example, that they were so, readable. I, I think um, England probably, my perspective, and Denise, feel free to like disagree, but my perspective is, yeah, I, I think England even more than the US. Because with, with the United States team, like I said before, you know, they had four Blood Angel players. So honestly, when I was trying to work out what factions people were going to be playing, what lists roughly, it, it was pretty hard for the US until very close to the event. But with the, with the English team, um, you know, like players like Manny and stuff like that, they play a lot of singles events. And 
because they have so many singles events leading up to WTC, if I see three different GTs with the same list from the same player, odds are they're using these events for practice. Like you'd have to be reasonably silly not to play your WTC list because you get value mm -hmm. out of it. So, you know, looking at BCP or, um, you know, lists online, we were able to determine quite a bit of what England was getting ready for. And that actually guided um, some of our teams make up in pairings because we, it's not so much that we knew exactly what they were going to play, but we knew that, you know, players like, for example, Alex Harrison, uh, we assumed, and I think we assumed correctly or deduced rather, I think is a nicer way to say we didn't mm -hmm. guess he was going to be a big hitter. And so based on yeah. that, um, seeing him play a big hitter army like Imperial Knights that shoot shitload, he's probably going to be going up early in the pairings process because he wants to pick table. We we'd worked that out weeks before this sub, and I think we were spot on with that one. And so we were sort of able to guide him into matchups that we thought Hayden would be able to minimize the loss, <laughs> um, but also we were able to guide other armies into things that were favorable. Like, we, we got their Necron list that, you know, Necrons are amazing. We got Necrons into our GSC player, who has played against me dozens of times. He knows Necrons inside and backwards. And I don't think anyone knows GSC inside and backwards apart from Eric. So mm -hmm. for once, the Codex favorability was in Eric's favor. And, and lots of other examples like that. We, we were really ready for the English round. Mm. I think, um, yeah, like Liam said, the aside from a couple of the lists, like the Free Blade Lance, a lot of the English lists, and I don't want this to be heard as an insult because they're a great, great team of guys. A lot of the lists were known quantities, and because they were known quantities, they were easier to pair into. Um, however, the pilots behind them were absolute weapons. Um, I think we had a few things go our way, like Liam's game against the BA really blew out, which is great. Um, Chris's game really blew out. Um, Eric, when he realized the Sanctus could turn off the auras of the Silent King, he's like, huh, I win this. And then he just went for the 20. I remember there's a point Eric turned around to me yeah. and he's like, I'm going for the 20. Don't talk to me for 40 minutes. And we just left, <laughs> left Eric and um, let him. And that was a, a commonality for the round. It was like, don't talk to Eric until he's finished his turn three drops. And then we can tell him what's going yeah. on. So when that happened, I was like, cool. As long as Simon and, and a few of the other players just hold strong and and stuff, we'd, we'd get the win. Um and we were over the moon about this um, about this round for, for two reasons. Um, one of the big ones is, you know, we saw Jeremy Martino and Matt Morisoli really come into their zone today after, a, on that third day, after a day one, day two with a bit of a rocky mm -hmm. start. They scrapped their heart out, you know, in, in, in this round. And it, we'll talk about the Poland round as well. Um, the second thing was on the tables behind us. We saw Poland absolutely dropkick Team USA in the nicest way possible. Oh. Um, but But that... <laughs> We, we looked, and I looked at Eric's eyes when I told him that, and there was just tears rolling up when Eric realized we're playing Poland for the win. <laughs> yeah. So, to, Tom, I, I, go I, I got to tell you, like, you know, my game was going really, really well. I was having an awesome time with my opponent, and I heard, I heard Poland were crushing the United yeah. States, and i got to be honest, when that happened, I looked to my opponent, and I'm just like, I'm going to end this quickly. I need to yeah. go watch that. And like, I, like, I'm honestly just like, because he basically, he basically said to me, we, we were playing for fun at the end. It was a really rough game for him. He was just like, do you want to call our game? And do you want to go watch Poland? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> it was, it was, oh, it was, we were so excited for Poland. Yeah. And again, Polish discord exploded when that happened. So we were all so happy again for, I think broadly understood reasons, you know, uh, <laughs> The celebrities versus as how did Nick Nanavati put it? Unknown players or no, sorry, good players that well, no one the knows. Best players in the world that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it was just so nice when it happened. So yeah, uh, I totally understand. So yeah, so let's talk about the, you know, the the most important round of the tournament, the the final. Um how did you again, um was it stressful for you? I imagine it was. How did you handle that? How did you how did you feel entering the game? Yeah, I think um, you can talk about how the round went, Liam. I'll, I'll just quickly cover kind of the before and and it was interesting what we did before every round. Um, you know, we'd do our pairings at the lunch table, we'd have some food, and then we'd kind of go outside and just relax and sit down and just shoot shit and you know laugh at Matt Morisoli or something. And um, 
psychologically, that's a, a really cool um, element. And you probably, you guys may have heard about it at work. It's called the third space, where if you have like issues, oh, if you have you know high stress environments at work, it, it pays to take yourself out of that environment for a bit, mentally reset, come back in. So I think us just going out for that one hour, just chill, chilling, shooting the shit, getting some drinks, mm-hmm. getting our minds calm. Um, and then coming back in with a really strong positive attitude was, was really good. Um, look, not going to lie, the, the round against Poland, um, you know, it was, it was going to be hard for, we knew the pairings would be, be difficult. Um, we knew that things could slide horribly wrong if we did the wrong thing. Um, and we really had to back ourselves. And I remember one of the conversations Eric had, for example, with Liam is we, we realized that if we were able to get the cron mirror, um, you know, it was actually really good for us. Um, and we, we said, Liam, w- what do you think you can get? And Liam confidently backed himself, said, I'm going to get a 14 in this mirror. And look, it, it ended up happening. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we we got got ourselves some good stuff. We got our Chaos Knights into Drakari, which was great. We offered up the tower mirror, which was rejected, which is kind of what we wanted. Um, and mm-hmm. the tower took our sisters. I think that was Skark <laughs> playing the tower. Um we got um, yeah Liam into the Necron mirror, which was you know amazing for us, um, and Eric into into the sisters, which was um, going to be a good game for him if he really turned the gas on. So we we paired to a predicted, I think a predicted ninety five or hundred, which was incredible. It, was, okay. it could not oh, have really? got any better. Yeah, it could mm-hmm. not have got any better. Um, and Liam, do you want to talk about the the games the round? Yeah, so you know, like Tanith was talking about, we felt like against England and then against Poland that our pairings team really blew it out of oh, the water. Like amazing. they sunk my battleship. Um, they, they did an awesome job. And it's really high stress um, because, you know, like we said, the Australian focus has always been to back individuals to support the team. And so, you know, when we worked out a few pairings in advance that, <clears throat> excuse me, it was really likely that I was going to play the Necron Mirror. That's stressful, obviously, playing any mirror match um, against a team with such a tough reputation is stressful. Um, and, you know, I, I was I was really glad that all of the Australians could back themselves. I think one of the, one of the other things that cannot be understated is that, um, you know, like Denise said, Australia likes to banter. Um, we do talk an alarming <laughs> amount of bullshit. Um, and so, you know, we, 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 we're at the table and Matt Morizoli is quite possibly the largest and loudest 40K player at any 40K <laughs> event. Um, and so... When I forget what Team Poland put up first, but Matt yells very loudly, "Just as planned!" And you know, like, it's, it's, <laughs> honestly, he's just he's just making it challenging. And you know, every single round, Matt took his shoes off and put his shoes on the table, and so just just to be difficult. And you know, he he's laughing. Team Poland was laughing and having a, a really good time. And I think. As pairings went on, we felt like we were doing really well. You could see Australia get hyped up. Our players were getting, you know, we were smiling. We were getting excited. And I felt like um, over the course of the pairings process, I think Team Poland worked out that the matchups went pretty well overall. Mm-hmm. And so the, the there started to be a few, a few frowns on the other side of the table, um, which then made us feel even better. And so it was kind of this, this a bit of a vicious cycle of morale. Yeah, like yeah. M- my game in particular, um, I played Necron mirrors in both teams and singles, um, and like obviously I was one hundred and ten percent focused on my game. So, Denise, you probably have a better perspective on the other games, um, but I um, I ended up playing um, T- Tomaz. Um, oh, yeah, so Nick, yeah, Nick, um, Nick, playing Necrons, and uh, you know I'd heard going into it that he was reasonably new. Um, to like the, the team and, and the scene, but that he was an absolute wonder kid, uh, an absolute weapon. The prodigy, yeah, um, absolutely. Now, uh, now, for, for the record, there is nothing. So I'm so I'm so sorry if he he's going to listen to this, but there is nothing you can say to Liam that makes me more excited than here <laughs> and then some, than somebody being called a wonder kid. Liam so, is the wonder boy mm, slayer. <laughs> so, like, honestly, if you come to me and you go, this guy is, like, he's a real up-and-comer, I'm like, must yeah. crush him. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, 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 Kill their I, hope. I, I, so, like I, I went into this game and I, I was really, really excited. Um, I felt like Poland's Necron list was 
the other Necron list at the event who got it. And I, I, maybe I, that's I believe your too- exact words, Liam, was Poland's Necron list is the second best Necron list at the event. <laughs> yeah, but I was paraphrasing <laughs> to me. God damn it, he's ratted me out. Okay. <laughs> but no, like in, in all in all seriousness, that, that is what I said. And I, I say that because looking at all the other Necron lists, everyone else had Catans and, yeah. you know, all these little three-man units. But no, um, you know, the, the Poland Necron list had two big destroyer blobs. He had five man Tomb Blade units, not like little three mans. He, I felt like he really understood how that codex could be played to the maximum mm. like power level. And bloody hell, was he a wonder boy? Seriously, he was an. Um, so he told me he played a lot of like so many games on TTS. Mm-hmm. And that was really, really clear because in his deployment, in his scout moves and whatnot, he was so transparent about screening me out and stopping certain things. I think one of the things that um, on reflection uh, was really, really tough for my opponent, but also I think tough just in general coming from TTS, like a lot of TTS to real life 40K is that sometimes how models sit on terrain and how models interact with WTC terrain is different. And so the, the best example here was that he, he did an awesome job stopping my destroyers from killing his destroyers because we both worked out in deployment that if I can kill destroyers and trade my unit for one of his, the net loss for him is more because mm-hmm. I have other, lots of other units. And so he did a really good job screening me out and you know shooting me from 36 inches away so that I couldn't retaliate using his um, tomb blades and his scop tech destroyers because he went first to stop me from veiling. But the one sort of mistake I guess that he made was that I'd used my scarabs in a ruin to the far right hand side of my deployment zone and I scouted them forwards. And I did this because I was hoping to pull his scop tech units away from the center of the table. The reason mm-hmm. I did that is the center of the table had two small WTC ruins and the small ruins have windows. And I worked out pretty quickly that because they have windows, I probably can veil a Necron destroyer unit and put their bases in the windows so that they can draw a line of sight through the windows. Because in WTC, if you have breachable, you're allowed to put your models in the the doors of the ruins on Mm -hmm. the bottom floor, if that makes sense. And he did the right thing. He screened me out by saying, you can't fit on the far side of the ruin if you veil. But I didn't have to go all the way through the ruin. I could actually go on my side of the ruin and cut a couple of models into the windows. And that's a situation that never occurs in TTS because yeah. obviously like terrain is fucky on TTS, mm-hmm. but also that's quite a unique situation at WTC that I, I was aware of because I- I've played hundreds of games with the format. And so when it happened um, and I was able to shoot six out of seven of my destroyers at his destroyer unit, it was a really big turning point in the game. Mm-hmm. And I think pr- pretty pretty firmly that was what cemented the fourteen six that the I the defining moment of the game, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in on on reflection, you know, um, I think he came back morale wise really really well. A lot of players, when something like that happens, you know, you get a judge because it's an important critical moment. The judge comes over and goes, "Yes, Liam can do what he's doing. That's in our players' pack." When that happens, it's really easy to get rattled and demoralized. Mm-hmm. My opponent did not get rattled or demoralized he came back and rallied for every single point from there on out he started being a little bit more defensive and used the other destroyer unit amazingly i was not even at the end of the game his other destroyer unit survived till after the game i couldn't i couldn't get it because he protected it so well and you know it was really awesome to play a game where every movement every bit mattered um shout out you know i know he's going to listen to this he was an awesome 40k player Sounds like like a game worthy of the final. Yeah, it was. It was awesome. <laughs> and, you know, I I was so focused on that game that after that round, by the time we were done, because we almost ran out of time as well. By the time that was done, the only games still to go were Matt Morozoli's um, and Simon's game. And Denise, you you're a storyteller. Tell us oh, about man. the last two games. 
so I guess to put it into context, we paired in the 90s. Um, Chris Wright felt really good into the Harlequins, and that game spiraled down pretty badly. So we were projected in like the mid-80s. So there's a world where we got a draw. Um, Chris Wright managed to get four points out of that, which is good. And he, he came out of it with tears in his eyes. He, he was like, Denise, I thought I just lost, I thought I just lost Australia, the WTC. He was so convinced that he, he'd, mm. um, you know, done a big wrong. And I was like, no, Chris, it's not a one man thing. It's a team. You, you did your thing. You got your four points. That's great. Um, we had Hayden Walduck <laughs> who was playing Tau, I think into Pumbaa's Tyranids. Um, and Hayden was on 22 points at the end of, at the start of his turn three or end of his turn three or something like that. And he mm-hmm. managed to put on about 80 points on the scoreboard in like two and a half turns, um, with the Kalyon Tau army. Yeah. So that, that last minute flip combined with Matt Jackson getting a 14, six into, um, into, I think, Tufus's um, Drakari. Mm-hmm. And Matt Morisoli, the big rig, getting three points out of Duda was crazy. Like, I, I went and, like, jumped on him and, like, gave him a big hug <laughs> after he got the three. Um, Jeremy Martino against Skark. Um, Jeremy was playing sisters against the Tau, and Jeremy went first and just said, look, um, Skark's picked secondaries that get him to a maximum 89 points. So Jeremy said, look, I'm just going to run at him, get to 70 mm-hmm. points myself, get tabled and just bring back a score um, to kind of just bulwark the Tau Army. Yeah, and, and he got a nine. He got nine. Uh, he got 11-9 lost, but Jeremy brought back nine points. And then it was all waiting on Simon. He needed 12 <sighs> points. And Simon's he playing, playing a Tyranian army. He, um, he was playing t- pretty much to time every single game. So for the last three rounds, USA, England, Poland, he was the last game to finish. Mm-hmm. Um, and he needed 12. The issue was from turn three, he had like six minutes on his clock. So he had to play these rapid turns. Um, but he was playing against, uh, the night player and he just taken the board and it was just a matter of Simon doing minimum activations, getting his points. And I re- I just remember waiting and waiting and waiting for what felt like two hours, which was actually about five or six minutes at Simon's mm-hmm. table. Cause we, we, we all, we no one wanted to say it. We knew he had the twelve. We we knew he was going to get the score. We just wanted to make sure he got to time. We didn't get a penalty or anything like that. And Liam, I oh, can't even describe how it felt when the score went in. We we all just lost it. We so all lost it. I again, I felt like watching that game end took like three hours. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I I remember this conversation because like, like Denise said, we. Simon is a very meticulous 40k player and throughout the event he was consistently the last game in in most rounds to to finish and because of that there's a lot of stress watching Simon play when he has like four minutes to do two turns it's so stressful but also one of the things was that because it's the final and the judges at WTC were very very professional this year they were very transparent going into the round that um, they were going to be very meticulous about time so we sort of realized that, you know, there is a world. There is a world where Simon runs out of time and his opponent makes back a lot of that score. And so, I, you know, I remember looking at the clock and I'm pretty sure, like, you know, you see the individual seconds clocking by and you feel like it's the, it's the doomsday clock. Like, yeah, this, yeah. And again, the rules are very robust. As a player, I'm not allowed to talk to another player during the round. But you just want to run over and strangle them and be like, move faster, you idiot. Like, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah, you just, like, I just want to go over and slap him. So I, I think um, one of the coaches, Wayne Russell, he saw me, I think, do about five laps of the table, walking like an absolute lunatic. And Wayne was like, Liam, go get a beer. You, you, need, to, you need to stop. You need to go get a, a, a strong drink and come back a bit later. Um, yeah, no, honestly, so stressful. Oh, my God. Mm, yeah, I mean, again, uh, this brings me to to the memory of the Polish Discord, where people were like, "I remember typing that I I I have no nails left to bite just because it was <laughs> they're all gone, <laughs> they're, all, they're all gone." So, and and many people were like that. You know, there were people who said they were sac- like putting their neighbors at sacrifice to the gods <laughs> of dice, to <laughs> turn it into our favor, and so on. Unfortunately, yeah. we didn't manage. So, yeah, I mean, guys, um, congratulations one more time. I think, you know, what you did uh, surprised everyone uh, because you showed great maturity. I mean, from what you're saying, even, you showed great maturity 
you've so you've shown I think I can say perseverance because as I said, your road to that success was bumpy, difficult, windy, and yet you know you you came out of it successful. Um, from what I gather, you showed e exemplary, incredible team spirit. So I mean, it's you know it, you you are a role model to follow, like to or you know. Oh come on, man! No, seriously, seriously, <laughs> but that, that's. I'm That's not crying, said. you're crying, Liam. <laughs> get off, get <laughs> off my case. Get <laughs> off my case. Onions. I, I am a little bit. I'm uh, sure there's going to be a video on this recording, but yes, I am tearing up a little bit. I'm going to make it a video, a video <laughs> uh, just for you. Um, just to show people, you know, those emotions. No, but seriously, um, you've, you've shown the world what this game is about. You've shown the world what that tournament is about, uh, that you can come... For some, even as an underdog, and you can absolutely demonstrate, you know, that perseverance, that skill, that all, all of those things. So yeah. Well, there's no, um, there, there's no higher higher award, right, than the WTC. And I guess the the icing on the cake was, um, you know, when when we took it out, we also took out best sport, and that that blew our mind. You know. Yeah, you stole that from Canada. <laughs> Yeah, we had so many people come up to us in different rounds going, oh, I, I hope you guys really win it, you know, nothing against our opponents, but they were just saying, you know, I really hope you guys win it, you're, you're... and every every morning we'd roll in and we'd have music playing, and, you know, we we tried to be the big uplifting team, and um, as the coaches, you know, we, we always like to walk around the hall and kind of say hi to the other coaching team, so... Um, you know, it was it was really gracious, and it was pretty rewarding that we got best sport at the end of it, as well as playing hard for the win. The, yeah, the only uh, thing... The only thing I disagree with you on, Tom, uh, was uh, maturity. So, uh, look, <laughs> the, 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 the Australian team has has many things. Moist toes is one of them. Um, mm. But uh, so just to put it in perspective, you know, we're getting ready to play the USA. Um, we're, we're very, very stressed out. And we're sitting outside, sort of just taking a bit of a breather. And uh, Matt Morozoli's taken off his shoes. He's taken off his socks. And, <laughs> and he's slapping Jeremy Martino across the face with his filthy socks. And Jeremy's standing up being like, I'm in the red! And he's getting, Jeremy you know, they're, they're about to... gagging. He's like... They're, they're, they're like about to have a fist fight. fight. You know, uh, Matt Jackson's farting on the Richter scale. Um, <laughs> good, yeah, on Ligma. You know, it's like, it's just... It, it was getting honestly out of... So I had to explain to way too many opponents that Australian humour is bad. It's just not yeah. good. Um, and so, you know, people would go up and ask their opponents, you know, do you have the, <laughs> so, do, do you have the mind goblin relic in your army? And then they would be like, what's the mind goblin? And you're like, do you mind goblin my balls? Or so, and yeah. you're like, it would, it like, it was we just got so bad. many or like, people you know, mind goblins. Or, 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 so, or like, how, how's Gold. Mike in your team going? And they'd be like, who's Mike? You're like, Mike Cock. And it's just, it was just, it was honestly so obnoxious and so okay. childish. I, I go back on the maturity part, but the, the, yeah, the, honestly, the rest, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Yeah, the rest, absolutely, you've shown everything that I mentioned. Um, so yeah, I mean, absolute, you know, best sports, best, best humor at the event probably as well. Um, I'll use this moment also to shout out the the, the, the Polish team uh, because I think the Polish guys did amazing. They show commitment. They show you know hours of preparation and so on. And I recall after the event when when we lost, I went to like Tiffus or Typhus to uh, to some other guys. And I went to Pumba as well. And I, I I tried to you know like console them, but at the same time reassure them that this is a huge success. Like they, they shouldn't be ashamed of anything. And uh, and Pumba said something that that I I wanted you guys to know. Uh, he said that you know this is not a it's a rough translation. So. He said something along the lines of, if anyone other than Poland should win this event, it should be Australia. No one was more deserving than you guys. So, I mean, that, I, I guess so that's the best that. summary. That's Thanks, really man. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, to wrap this up, um, maybe just a little bit of shit throwing uh, before we finish. Uh, was there anything about the event that you didn't like? And I mean, like, maybe not other players, but the organization, anything that, you know, the the organizers maybe should learn about and do a better job this year. So look, th there are some things that I think are, are out of like you know Tom Isaac and Neil's control. Um, like for example, the fact that the event was held on the surface of the sun. 
Um, <laughs> that 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 was that was tough. Uh, it, it, even even for Australians, it was hot. Like it, it was that very means very hot. I'm pretty sure I got heat exhaustion on the second day of singles. You actually I, did, man. I, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I had like an 18 hour migraine. <laughs> Holy crap! Like I, uh, on reflection, I don't know how teams that didn't have four coaches coped. Because, for example, I drank 10 bottles of water a game. Uh, and, and in all seriousness, without somebody to actually support that, I would have to leave the table all the time. Um, so that, that was tough. I, I think overall, <clears throat> my, my reflection on the event was I loved it overall. And I, you know, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing Tom Adriani's shirt right now for the purposes <laughs> of this recording. Um, <clears throat> so I, I love those guys very, very much. The one thing I think was pretty universally fed back was that first day was a killer. Um, three rounds in day one with, you know, the four hour rounds is yeah. a pretty intense day. But I think what really cemented it for me as a tough day was that um, in, in Mechelen, it can be a little bit challenging to get dinner um, that late at night. Like realistically, yes. we were trying to buy dinner at 11 p.m. Um, and then you've got to do pairings for the next day. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to go back to the hotel and shower. I, I got six hours sleep that night, and that was yeah. with us trying as fast as we could to get dinner and go to sleep. So I think that that's the one thing I would feed back that I think um, I know it's hard with so many teams, but I just don't think you can do three rounds in a day. I just don't, I just don't think it's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. All right, Denis, your take? Anything else? Look, um, I mean... One of the one of the things that surprised me was, like, I hadn't been to a WTC or an ETC before, and the biggest tournaments I'd, I'd been to in Australia or even out of Australia were about 120, 130 people. But mm. Let's say, oh, Happy was uprising, like 130-ish, um, and Capital City, when I went to, was 140 in Canada. Um, so WTC is is a way bigger scale than that. So you've got, what, 28 by 8, so 200-plus players. Um the fact that the terrain was so, you know, universally uniform, the, the, the fact that all the sponsorship, all the, all the merchandise was done so well, it, this was a professional convention. This was, this was not some random GT or major, you know, the, the level of planning that's gone into this, um, it was, it was a professional, you know, outfit and, and that was really amazing. Um, look, I would say what Liam said, it's, it's, it's a hard thing when we've got four hour rounds to try and fit three in a day that, that look, there, there might be a world where it can happen, but it's like an early start, it's like a seven thirty start realistically. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how that problem will be solved with, with a pod stage. Um, cause the seven rounds really at the end of the day was required to, to get mm -hmm. to the, get to the end, um, to get to a true undefeated, but, um, yeah, look, I, I can't. Other than that, I can't really fault these guys on what they've done. It's an amazing achievement, um, and the quality of the event was was stellar. Um, I personally, not to not to throw shit, but I, I personally got a little bit bored of the lovely Mechelen after about six days. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a lovely small town, but um, limited in terms of kebab shops. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's there for another two years, isn't it, in Belgium? Yes, that's true. So, yeah. But no, I would, um, you know, with the right team, I would love to, love to do this again. Life, life willing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one thing that I would add to this, and I think, again, I don't know about other countries, but I know that this was like a sentiment shared across like the entire Polish discord and, and community who was trying to follow, and I'm stressing the word trying to follow the event, was that we had to try, that we didn't have like a reliable stream to watch like for for an event of this stature of this gravitas not to have i mean uh you know the the, the french war gaming did a great job obviously for their community i know that the stream was crowdfunded uh, sorry funded by the community so kudos to them for pulling this off uh i think at the end of the, the event they 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 kind of realize that what they are doing is not just for the French community anymore, it's just for everyone. So, you know, they started doing interviews with players. They team, their team hasn't been playing with you guys, with the Polish guys, and so on and so on. So that was great. But it was, again, for the event of that grandeur, I think there should be like an official stream for everyone to follow, to put on Reddit, to put on Facebook, to put on... I don't know if they cooperate with Warhammer community or not, but even there, just because that's like a holiday that's like 
you know, the biggest festivity 40k sees outside yeah. of, I don't know, LBO yeah. and so on. Well, at the, Why not at the end of the day, like we, we had to be our own media team, you know, like the Team yeah. Australia page, the America page, like all, all the, yeah, much of the Polish team did the same thing. Like we, we were our own stream, like we were doing our own videos and posts and things. And that was the way we were getting the message out. Um, and me and Pete, one of the other coaches were, were doing that for Australia, but I know Nick was doing it for America and things like that. Look, it, it was a bit of a shame. Um, I, I would say though, the French Wargamer stream, my goodness, they've got some good tech. Like... Oh, I yeah. reckon that's a fifty, sixty thousand dollars setup they've got um, yeah. with the cameras that can zoom Holy in, shit. and it was Excuse amazing. My language. When, I was so impressed. I was way focused, like during singles, so I didn't really like check it out until that final day of singles where I was playing on the stream. And when I got there, and there's like sixteen monitors for like two yeah. dudes, I was yeah. like. Is this NASA? Like what? Yeah, like, these motherfuckers yeah. are sending something to the moon. Why like, is the moon exactly. mission here? What is happening? Yeah. Yeah. Like, at was... some point, they, at some point, I think you know when the event was slowly wrapping up and and most of the teams weren't playing anymore, they started doing this. Like the they were doing rounds with the camera, show, showing like the, the the venue and showing their own setup. And you could see it was like a freaking radio studio with all the yeah. like you know panels and so on that they had. I was yeah. really impressed. So. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's definitely you know they've set the standard on on you know the tech that that we can get to. So if there's Absolutely. a world where you know the WTC can have its own stream or you know Warcom comes to the table and 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 does it at that level, that's what will really launch our our game to the to the to the next stage, right? Like the getting the yeah. viewership up, making it more more accessible, uh, more relatable is a big one. Like how do we how do we, you know, get the players on the tabletop transferred to, you know, communicating that to an audience? And I think the, mm -hmm. the French war game stream was was the next step in that. So it was amazing. Yeah. So again, thanks to French war gaming for amazing coverage that helped us. You know, without you guys, we wouldn't have probably seen the majority of the event. So uh, job well done. Absolute last question, and I'll let you go because I know that you have other uh, commitments. What's next up for you guys? So, um, you know, are you taking a longer break from 40k? Are you like fed up with the hobby, or completely opposite? Already prepping for another tournament. What's up? Um, so for for me, I'm a I'm a hardcore addict. This is my drug of mm. choice. Um, I have Australia's Ben Warrior coming over this afternoon to play a 40k game. Uh, two okay. days after I land back in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I am no rest for the wicket. In fact, I've even brought a table of WTC home uh, terrain home in my bag. I've set it up. It's just over there. Okay. Uh, and it's going to be used this afternoon. <laughs> I think the next um, the next real thing for me uh, is going to be another Teams event, actually. I'm going to the west side of Australia uh, to play in a big Teams event called the WA West Australian Team Champs, uh, where I'm going with a, a group of newer players. Um, Pete... Uh, one of the Australian coaches is going to be on my team for that too. Um, and it's going to be good. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Denis? Look, um, it was a big trip. Uh, same as Liam. You know, this is my drug of choice, 40K. Um, and, you know, it was a big trip. A lot of prep. Financial cost was solid as well for us. Um, look, I'm, I, I love this hobby. And, you know, being part of... Being part of that team, you know, even not as a player, just as a coach, was has been the highlight of my 40k career. It definitely has. Um, when when we won, I was inconsolably crying for about 10 minutes. I I was just for a bit. I was on the ground. And you see the video of the team Australia celebrating for the first half of that video. I'm on the ground in little balls, just hands on face crying. <laughs> so um, like that that I've that was one of the happiest moments I've I've had from sport or gaming ever. Um, I'd I'd love to do it again with the right team. Love starting with the right team. Um, in terms of personal stuff, in terms of tournaments at home, look, I'll I'll play a few more towards the end of the year, but I've I've definitely calmed down a bit because it was a big trip. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to kind of get life back in order. But um, but um, and the price you wanted that from what I hear as well for you guys. Yeah, look, it wasn't definitely wasn't cheap, but um, I think it's probably no, it was five not. five to six thousand Australian dollars expense, um, including everything. What's that? About four thousand euro. That, Three and a half, four thousand euro. So, um, look, I, I, we've got you know the, the the big singles tournament coming up in Australia is Uprising in January. So, uh, me and Liam are both going to that. Well, you're going to that, right, Liam? Yeah, yeah, clearly. Um, so, you know, that's the next one on the horizon for me personally. But until then, I, I might take the rest of the year to just chill out and play a few smaller events, and we'll keep pumping the podcast. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm keen, mate. 
Okay. So, yeah, first of all, uh, again, I'll congratulate you. But I'll congratulate you on achieving what my mission is and the mission you know, of, of our podcast, as I mentioned in the pre-recording chat, mm. is to show the world that there is something outside of the United States and that people outside of the States can also play this game. You, ju- you, you did exactly that. Um, so kudos. Is there anything or anyone that you want to shout out, any you know, plug that you want to place in here? The, the floor is yours. Liam? I mean, I was really, really honored um, when I was playing Team Poland. I, I hear uh, the rumor is that the Normal Blokes podcast is a regular listen of the, the, the Polish community. <laughs> and so I would, be, I would be shameless if I didn't uh, use this opportunity to uh, self-plug. We will definitely be doing our own WTC episode um, with a focus on um, both Denith and Wayne, who got best Death Guard player uh, at the WTC singles. Uh, absolute giga chad for Wayne. Wouldn't be a podcast for me tonight <laughs> if we didn't mention Wayne from the podcast. Um, so, you know, uh, please give us a listen. We're very, very casual. Um, we are not very good sometimes, but we love this game and we love talking about it. Yeah, if you want quality, we're not the people for that, mate. So uh, if you just want something to listen to. Just... <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. Um, yeah. the, the aim is to improve the competitive 40K experience. Um, sometimes we improve the comedy not experience. The, not, not the results, the experience. That's it. That's definitely, it. definitely uh, to me, and I devour podcasts like a, like a crazy person, uh, most entertaining podcast out there. You oh, guys. Thank you. So, yeah, <laughs> Thanks, absolutely. Mate. To anyone who's listening to us right now, Pause. Go check them out. Please. Um, <laughs> look, I'd, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the WTC organisers, you know, Tom, Neil, Isik, all the, all the referees. It was such, like I've said before, it was such a professional outfit. Um, you could see the hard work that's gone into it. All the referees were amazing. You know, whenever we needed needed a, a call or we needed something done, they were very professional. They kept all emotion out of it. They were, they were super, super um, in terms of their their performance so you know we have full faith in in that organization going forward um and i i just want to like i'd like to thank you know the rest of the team australia our coaches players for, for all your hard work um you know obviously a lot a lot has has been done to get everyone there in terms of the families partners you know things have been put on hold and and they've they've all sacrificed to get us there so thank you to all of them um and and yeah, I guess thanks, uh, Tweak, for the opportunity to come on your show and and talk shit to the Polish community. And um, I'm sorry, yeah. I've got I've got one more. I'm going to be really lame. I'd actually like to thank my wife first of all for not divorcing me from going <laughs> to uh, Belgium uh, two months after we got married, but also um, for standing at the airport with an enormous inflatable balloon that said "Number One Champ" when we arrived. <laughs> in Brisbane, which was oh. super embarrassing, but super awesome. Um, I love her very much. The unsung heroes of 40K, the wives, the, the lonely wives that <laughs> wait for their husbands until they come back home. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's beautiful. So listen, guys, uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for, you know, uh, the like a very comprehensive description of what went on. Uh, I think our listeners will appreciate it very much. Um, Again, congratulations uh, to our listeners. If you like what you hear, uh, go and listen to The Normal Blokes. Uh, If you like what you hear, also leave a like, subscribe, follow us, ask questions. If you have any questions to to, to me or to the guys, I, you know, uh, post them in the comments. I'll relay them to the guys, I'm sure. I mean, I'm bold in that statement, but I'm sure they, 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 they won't deny you an answer if I send the questions to them. So, uh, yeah, use that opportunity, uh, help us grow, help them grow, and uh, there will be more fantastic content on the internet. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you for joining. And until next time. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.